introduce her. So Tara is an associate professor at Self Sociology uh, in the Augustana Faculty at the University of Alberta in Canada. She works in the area of social theory, visual sociology, urban culture and digital media. Her current research uh, explores new and contested ways that photographic images of, of identifiable strangers are generated and distributed across contemporary public spheres. Uh, with this raising critical questions about what it means to be a social person to to have it and create a world together. Uh, so Tara, if you're around there, yeah, I got if you are. Um, the floor is yours. So. Okay, thank you. I'm going to just share screen. Can you see the uh, the image? We can, yep. Yeah. Great. Okay, great. great. Um, good. This is the only visual that I will use, and it's a pretty um, prolifically circulated um, image compilation that I'm sure many people have uh, have already seen. Okay, so I want to begin by thanking um, everybody at Open Book Publishers and Laura for organizing this event, committing to this book, and making it widely accessible to readers around the world. It's, it's so wonderful that it's uh, open access. And I also want to give a shout out to the editors of the volume, fellow contributors and members of the audience um, today uh, and, and beyond. Uh, so in my brief presentation, I'm going to say a little bit about my chapter, talk about the questions that I had, and what I think was significant about the case of digital vigilantism that I analyzed. So my chapter is called Make Them Famous, Digital Vigilantism and Virtuous Denunciation After Charlottesville. It is an interpretive visual sociological case study of a very high profile social media campaign that was aimed at de-anonymizing or outing participants who were filmed and photographed during the widely publicized and violent white supremacist rallies that took shape in the streets of Charlottesville, USA in August, 2017. So these uh, rallies brought hundreds of participants together under the banner of Unite the Right um, and were widely reported upon around the world. And they also drew together hundreds of counter protesters animated by social justice concerns. So in my title, the phrase make them famous is borrowed from and makes reference to a grassroots social media call to action that you can see on the screen that was put forth by a young media activist using his existing Twitter account, Yes, You're Racist. Uh, if you recognize any of the Nazis marching, send me their names and profiles and I'll make them famous was how this call was articulated. So there were others, but this was the most high profile and well-coordinated site that was used to identify and later expose otherwise anonymous rally participants as such to audiences beyond those who were assembled uh, in person on those days. So correct identification opened rally participants up to various possible adverse consequences in their home communities and social networks. These effects included reputational damage, job loss, severing of relationships and other manifestations of disaffiliation as I detail through a small selection of individual cases in my chapter. So part of what was sociologically interesting for me about this case was the general ambivalence and moral uneasiness that exists today around digital media shaming and doxing, um, coupled with the suggestion that was made by one of the media commentators in this case that perhaps a quote, shame pass was in order here, given the exceptional nature of the events that inspired the social media call to identify participants. So additionally, in the prolific public discourse that these events generated, commentators often questioned whether or not it was reasonable for any participant in such a public event to expect to remain anonymous afterwards anyway. So could um, outing rally goers even be considered a, a violation? So these questions were part of um, the, the, the digital vigilantism campaign. People were thinking about what it meant to be doing it while, while doing it as is evidenced in, in many of the comments. So part of the work that I did in the chapter was try to uncover the unspoken or tacit assumptions which the highly dispersed social media activists and allies shared in their coordinated work of making rally goers famous through circulating images and words in the digital public sphere. So to understand 
how participation in this social media campaign was framed as quote, necessary and virtuous under the circumstances, I looked at the social media call to action in detail how it was and how it was taken up in some of the most circulated postings that it, that it generated. Uh, I also argued that to understand the social media campaign, um, it is critical to understand the sense of danger and exceptionality that was associated with the Unite the Right rallies in Charlottesville. So a much noted fact was that for the most part, rally goers were not hiding their faces while they marched in the public streets, uh, carrying torches, holding signs, and chanting slogans associated with Nazism and anti-Black racism. Rather, they were presenting themselves um, publicly into the world as a growing and legitimate presence. And now infamously, the former US President Trump did not initially denounce white supremacists by name, but rather referred to, quote, violence on many sides, as well as very, quote, fine people on both sides. So these were important factors um, for understanding how and why the social media campaign <clears throat> was taken up uh, by many dispersed participants and also commentators as something acceptable and even virtuous under the circumstances in spite of um, moral reservations around de-anonymizing tactics. So a question that I ask in, my, in the chapter is what would have been different about Charlottesville 2017 without the social media campaign that worked to de-anonymize participants after the dust had settled? In other words, what did this campaign produce or achieve and what are some of its significant social implications? So first, uh, I argued that the campaign helped to solidify a dominant meaning of what kind of event the Unite the Rally was within the broader public culture. So an ominously exceptional, socially dangerous, and potentially historically significant mo moment, even turning point within contemporary US society. It contributed to a united refusal within much of civil society to normalize and legitimate the proud expression of violent white nationalism and violent white supremacy, the kind of legitimation that rally organizers, vocal participants and event supporters who assembled under the Unite the Right banner were seeking and possibly anticipating. So it helped to reject the trappings of moral equivalency as if what was being enacted in Charlottesville in the streets was merely one political orientation among many. So the Trump response could only have intensified the felt necessity of such a refusal um, for the moral majority of concerned and outraged spectators to the events that, was, that were occurring in the streets of Charlottesville on those days. Um, the refusal to legitimate the terrain of violent white nationalism and supremacy was largely achieved, I argue, by making positive participation in such manifestations particular, personal, and thereby socially risky for the previously unknown and anonymous participant. So I argue that this was the unique aspect that the digital vigilantism campaign added to Charlottesville 2017. And as I stress in my chapter, uh, its power lay primarily in the socio-moral domain, not the formal legal domain. So whereas the vigorous public opposition, including counter rallies was largely articulated in relation to social justice principles, the targeting of individuals and the naming of participant names that was encouraged and coordinated through social media tools and platforms created conditions for a type of accountability and consequence for the otherwise um, anonymous and unremarkable rally participant. So the campaign of digital vigilantism took things beyond the level of a general condemnation um, of a series of events by making anyone's positive association with and during the events live on in ways that were potentially con um, consequential for those individuals. So I suggest that the prolific circulation of specific instances of correct identification and exposure constituted a public lesson of sorts in communicating to anybody who participates in such an event now or into the future to expect significant visibility. Such a lesson would be most likely to be effective for the participant for whom attendance um, was likened to a kind of casual thrill seeking or weekend adventure less so for the committed true believer. So as I stress throughout my chapter, the most powerful but also invisible force that enabled this 
digital vigilante campaign to have the effects that it did was the unspoken moral force of a shared vision of a world in which racially motivated hatred and violence must be made to have no legitimate place. That is why um, disaffiliation um, was the consequence for, for many people once they had been correctly identified um, as willing and enthusiastic participant. So uh, in my conclusion to the chapter, I state that, well, of course, campaigns of digital vigilantism can be inspired and undertaken um, for a variety of political, cultural, or personal interests. The case that I focus on in this book offers some insight into how such methods can be mobilized on behalf of social justice interests. Thanks. One of the things that I really liked about working on this book project is that we were asked to think about audiences. So the book is called, of course, Introducing Vigilant Audiences. And so one of the things that my case, and I think all of the um, presentations that we've heard today speak to is how um, the audience is changing for our, our acts, for better or for worse. So what it means to act before others, um, particularly in the public realm, uh, is really changing. and um, audiences are expanding um, in ways that are sometimes unpredictable, but I think that this is more and more something that that um, people can and, and, and should expect, particularly during public events that are considered socially significant and controversial, um, and especially a formal institutional responses or solutions are considered uh, inadequate or non-existent. So another thing that that I found really interesting in this case that I think has broader significance is that um, the power of de-anonymizing visibility doesn't lie in like pictures or names, but it, 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 it lies in a kind of shared vision of a world that people kind of feel and sort of spontaneously respond to such that um, somebody being identified as a participant in something that's largely condemned can have the kinds of social consequences that it does. So um, that's important to, to be mindful of. Another thing that um, we all had to think about in, in our, our papers for this book is, the, is, is how we are also implicated um, as, as authors, as researchers, and also just as, as citizens and co-producers of this um, fluid world that we live in. And so we all in our various ways and through our various positions have to grapple with these kinds of phenomena um, surrounding digital vigilantism uh, in all of their moral mixedness. So it's something that we, we all have to think about. Um, and in thinking about it, we, we have to think about the kind of world that we are co-creating co as we um, take action, respond, commentate, post, tweet, um, research, write about, uh, and so on, right? This isn't something that is like some thing out there that we're looking at through a microscope. We're, 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 we're in it as well. Uh, and it's very much part of, part of the contemporary world. Um, and so that's something that we, we all talked about um, in the, in the, in the, final decisions around our chapters and, and, um, and it's something that we all around the world uh, are grappling with.